morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever the part of the world you are. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor for me to be here. And uh, as a, one of the speakers of this 24 hour, the webinathon on, uh, on the importance of basic science in our day to day life. It's uh, being a biologist, uh, no, I did mention that uh, I'm a director of a biology research institution. Obviously, I'm a biologist. So much of my talk would be more uh, in the area of biological sciences. Before that, uh, just brief introduction about myself is right here. I'm a geneticist, developmental biologist, and also an evolutionary biologist. But, you know, obviously, evolution is something, a common thread across all of biological sciences across the scale and complexity of the, of the field. Uh, I did my PhD at Cambridge and I uh, worked at multiple places in India and currently at uh, Bangalore, uh, you know, at the southern part of India. My main interest outside research is in the area of education, particularly undergraduate education and uh, pedagogical innovations. And I'm also interested in public health, mostly uh, because of the pandemic, I got into this area. But earlier, or, you know, prior to pandemic, and even now, I'm generally interested in science administration policy and strategy and internationalization of science. And uh, uh, I'm also part of multiple, uh, you know, organizations and uh, various different initiatives. And, uh, and internationally, um, I'm a fellow of uh, European Molecular Biology Organization and uh, immediate past president of International Union of Biological Sciences, which is a partner to International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development along with other unions. With this introduction, uh, I'll go back to my talk. Uh, you now the title is somewhat uh, tongue twisting, I'm sure. Uh, more science of life for better science for life. As what I do is going to sort of discuss some of the fundamentals of biological sciences as discovered how they have helped to improve the the quality of life in general, and uh, at both at the conceptual level and uh, also at the level of, um, you know, how we live, uh, you know, ourselves in, in a society along with other uh, very diverse group of humans as our neighborhood. And being a, a you know, international and world environmental day, uh, obviously uh, it's also important that we learn, you know, from, what we have learned in biological sciences to improve the, the quality of our surroundings, particularly not just the physical parameters like, you know, pure air, you know, comfortable temperature and so forth and, and timely rainfall. It's also important that we sustain biodiversity. And, uh, you know, modern understanding of biology, particularly ecology and evolution has immensely helped the very different ways we can conserve and expand our biodiversity around surroundings. Unfortunately, we need you know, bigger commitment from, from entire world, every citizen and every society, every nation, every government to improve the, the presence of biodiversity on Earth. So uh, I'll start with very simple, uh, few examples, basically tracing the history of biological sciences, how the very understanding of life itself is helping understanding ourselves. As you all know, most you know, people will ask this question about who am I, what am I made up of, or what is my relationship with my surroundings, whether it is a physical surrounding or the biological surroundings. And you know, of course, human surroundings too, but human surroundings, you always give certain names that I belong to this community, I belong to this nation, or I belong to, you know, uh, you know, I'm a male or a female, I'm a younger person or older person and so forth. But it's more importantly is, is very existence of life on earth and very existence of human life on earth. We always ask this question. Philosophers have asked in the, every citizen, every, you know, a person could be a farmer in a small rural place or a person could be a corporate, you know, a CEO, ask these questions. So how we have addressed this question over a couple of hundred years in the past hundred years, uh, 200 years or so, uh, I just going to give an outline. Very quickly, if you are, I'm sure all of you have heard the Gregor Mendel's work and you also have read in your school textbook or later or even in newspaper, some of the work that you know, uh, Mendel did and we call him 
as father of genetics. He studied uh, the patterns of inheritance from how traits are inherited from parents to offspring. The bigger picture he was answering is not simply how a few morphologically you know, identifiable characters are inherited. The bigger question he was asking is how we inherit everything that constitutes life. For example, what is born to a pea plant or to a human parent, a couple of human parents, is another human being. First, it is another living organism. So what is inherited is the life in itself, all the features to make life. So this, the, the patterns of inheritance that Mendel discovered helped uh, subsequently to understand the chemical basis of life because then you start looking for what is being inherited, right? And that basically led to the discovery of DNA, which many of you have heard, and I'll come to that in a minute. In parallel, although they knew, didn't know about each other's work, Darwin was trying to understand life somewhat differently. Darwin was not simply looking at, you know, what are the different types of organisms that are present on Earth and how are they adapted to their local environment. To some extent, or it was, you know, he's, 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 he, tried, he, able, he was able to answer those questions in the immediate terms. But the long-term impact of theory of evolution as proposed by Darwin is helping us to understand the very origin of life and its diverse forms in which we see today. Which also, when it's coupled with the Darwin uh, Mendel's work, which will actually help us to understand various different aspects of the existence of life on Earth. And later, the very, the very different processes which are involved in, in maintenance of the living condition as against the non-living state of matter, right? All of us are made up of the same matter. I don't have to repeat here. We are basically, the bottom of everything is physics and uh, there's the matter that, you know, all the laws of physics that govern the matter, the same laws of physics govern the matter in our body, except that they're manifested somewhat differently and what we call as, you know, the life. And trying to understand that part is, you know, which basically happened in the mid 20th century or second half of 20th century. But the beginning, the conceptual understanding for this and the, the, the trigger of different way of thinking about life started with uh, the Gregor Mendel and uh, Charles Darwin. <laughs> now, in, in fact, you know, in, in Darwin's book, the, the origin of species, the last paragraph, there's one sentence or a phrase, he clearly mentions that perhaps there is a single origin of life. Today, you know, looking at the chemistry of life across all organisms, it's basically clear that at least there could be multiple different origins of life. What exists today as basically from one single origin of life. All others have must have become extinct in case there are multiple origins of life. Again, I don't have to get into the details for any audience of anywhere in the world. There is something called chemistry of life, right? Now, there is something what is called DNA is the genetic material and uh, RNA is an intermediate messenger where information that is coded in the DNA gets converted into another form of nucleic acid. And from this, the information is decoded in the form of protein. It's almost like saying that there is information written in the textbook or in a book, you read that information, perhaps you make a copy of that information uh, at, you know, at uh, basically, let's say, a temporary copy of this. DNA is a permanent copy. And that temporary copy, like RNA, is used, and so you send it to another place, let's say a factory or somewhere, you say that, use this information, can you, you know, fabricate something for me? And what is fabricated is a protein. And the protein, depending on the structure, depending on certain chemical properties of protein, will have certain specific function, right? And that basically is the, what you call as the very central to life, the chemistry of life, right? Now, this is similar across all organisms. Irrespective of whether you are a bacteria or a plant or any, any form of animal or a human, the DNA is exactly the same chemical entity and how information is is replicated or how DNA is copy itself, the process of DNA replication, what we call, is a chemical process is exactly the same. Similarly, when RNA is made, the process is, is exactly the same, and then the, the protein is made, right? 
and this process is called transcription and translation because simple way, you know it's a very you know interesting fun explanation to this process but it's a deep meaning to it transcription means you have taken the information to another script but the information in the same language translation means information is translated to another language similarly nucleic acid is a form of language and amino acid is another form of language dna and rna are nucleic acid language and protein is an amino acid language now most important information that both darwin and mendel were looking at how are we seeing these differences and why there are differences right if there is a particular form of life why there is multiple different forms of life what is the very the core to understanding the biodiversity core to understand the human diversity core to understand the differences within the family is to understand where the source of variations and how these variations interact with the environment right so interestingly the chemistry of dna is such that the very chemistry of dna that is it has nucleotides on two strands and the nucleotides on the both strands are complementary to each other they make certain kinds of chemical bonds we call as hydrogen bonds and very strong bonds and because of this they are very stable even at 90 degree centigrade temperature dna is stable only when it you increase the temperature to 95 and above you know it starts breaking down in fact there are bacteria which actually survives at even 120 degree centigrade there are certain mechanism to keep the dna you know well protected what coming back to this but sometimes there can be a small mismatch that can happen but because dna replication is a particular process called semi conservative replication that means the two strands get separated and strand a becomes a template to make a new strand strand b becomes a template to make another new strand so at the end of this one we'll have two copies of dna but each copy will have one old strand one new strand because of this if there is a small error in the dna replication like what you call as mismatch it gets carried to the next generation right that is your source of variation interestingly it's purely stochastic event you right you know the chemical you know you know bonds that are formed is because of the collision of atoms i'm sure all of you know about it and typically in the biological system there is a very clear over the time which what is evolved is a system in which these collisions are made more deterministic for example in the air for example sodium and hydrogen may be combining together and making an ammonia molecule but that the, the the quantitative level at which it happens whether it happens or not it's so rare that you will not smell ammonia you know in your you know simply in your bedroom or in the living room but in the biological system these collisions happen in a very organized state of matter that is present in the cell right because of which it happens at a much more deterministic pattern so but if the stochastic reason you know a for example supposed to go with t a may go with c right but that is tolerated for a short time otherwise the stability of the dna will not you know will, will be lowered if there is a mismatch but some for some of these you know one generation or so it is tolerated such kind of a mismatch and that what carries over as new variations it by the way I, i'm very consciously using the word variation not mutation because mutation in general public has a negative connotation mutation is always considered as something wrong something negative but variation is simply another variant there are you know we, in, in the context of viral pathogen like sars cov 2 a variant we call is a mutation and we consider it as something you know bad because that will affect us and it may cause diseases but the variation can also be beneficial even in the context of host pathogen interaction for example the omicron variant that came out you know in the end of 2021 turned out to be a boon because it spread widely at the same time it was not causing the disease and generated more immunity among the population whereas the delta variant was a deadly variant which basically caused you know huge number of deaths across the world and this process when it's reiterated is going on and on for the last 375 uh sorry 3150 million years or what you cannot call as 3.75 billion years and what you see on a national geographic you know uh, uh channel is the kind of biodiversity or different life forms that we see the you know the most beautiful ones are all 
irrespective of what they are, every one of those organisms are extremely beautiful. And the source of variation, that interaction with the environment is basically what helps to, um, you know, uh, explain not only what is life and also all forms of life that exist on Earth. So the integration of Mendelian genetics and Darwinian evolution, what has helped us to understand this. Now, in, one of the other things we also learned in basic science is without variation, there wouldn't have been a life immediately after the very first form of life was born or originated. It's nothing like born. Or born is when a life is born from another form of life, we call it as life, is birth. But otherwise, there is an origin of life. Origin of life happened at 3.75 billion years ago. If we were, let's say, static, there was no variation in the DNA replication. There was no new variant. Event. That la form of life would have become extinct on the same day because the environment is continuously changing. Environment changes because of the dynamics of the Earth and also the solar system. Environment is also changing because of the variation that, sorry, environmental perturbation that living organisms generate. For example, oxygen went to the atmosphere. Now we have 23% of oxygen in the atmosphere because of this, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the reactions that are happening in the living systems. So variations are extremely important. Now, diversity is key for survival. Without population level diversity, without population level diversity uh, in any form of organism, bacteria to human, you would not have survived as a species. What survives? what perpetuates is a population, although it may happen at the individual level, because the environment will have a sweeping impact on all individuals, and what survives is the ones which can survive in a given environment. So variations are very important. Making a population homogeneous is actually not uh, useful. So one of the other things we also want to know uh, is, you know, in which way it would help um, to know our own evolution. Now we have sufficient evidence for on human evolution. We also one of the branches of the Darwinian tree of life. And uh, in that one, we and chimpanzees form one uh, branch and chimpanzees be separated at two branches within that branch. And only about 5 million years ago from a common ancestral great apes. But human evolution is not a single step. There have been multiple steps, multiple species evolved and became extinct and only survived is currently the Homo sapiens. We are based on the fossil evidence, based on the dating, we know that there are so many species evolved and many of those species also exist at the same time and space uh, you know, in, in the past. For example, if you look at in the zero to one, in the, in the about first uh, you know, couple of hundred, you know, zero to one is basically 100,000 years ago. We are sort of millions of years ago. There is a time where three to four human species exist at the same time and space. For example, Neanderthals and Demonosovans, we existed at the same time and space as recently as 30 to 40,000 years ago. Not only we, you know, we uh, lived together, we also met with each other, we mated with each other. And in our genome, we actually carry uh, the Neanderthals or Denisovan genomes. That means human species uh, is not something called, you know, what people call as pure species. We are just part of any other animal. And we are going to the same process of evolution of a species giving rise to human. Now, the next part is fine. We all understood about the biological basis of our existence. We know a little bit about the matter, like DNA and RNA. But there is something called self, which we consider as something which is conceptually very different. You know, some people use the word consciousness, some people use words very different, other names. When I, I do not get into the uh, religious or politically different names associated with self, you simply understanding my uh, uh, being aware of myself. So let's say you consider that's understanding the self. So people have actually taken this forward very well using very different animal models. For example, that two insects, you know, they behave differently depending on the context, depending on their body size, depending on their status of hunger or something, suggesting that they have some understanding of the self and accordingly they behave differently. Uh, in a, in a, in, with other individuals. For example, if these two individuals are fighting, if something, you know, you know, consecutively three or four times, you know, loses the fight, it stops, you know, fighting with others, right? It has certain understanding of self. There are also very different experiments to suggest that, you know, that to some extent it has some understanding of its body size too. 
The great example is chimpanzees. People have shown that chimpanzees can actually recognize themselves in the mirror. There is no only only other animal other than human which can recognize itself in the mirror as per as far as we know is chimpanzees. And we considering that they have all have reached certain levels of cognitive abilities, but humans have certain additional abilities because of the language that we have evolved, and that language has helped us to pool our you know thoughts and experiences. So, for example, in all other animals. the experience of self what derive, drives them to do something different others cannot learn you know the innovation that happens in in its neighborhood we are the only one across the time whether it happened a 2000 year ago 3000 year ago we continue to use because the way we can explain to each other with the help of modern language the cause and effect relationship very different things that happen around us now i just coming back to this one variations in the dna copying mechanism is the most important aspect of chemistry of life and which watch basically helps us to generate these variations and very different environmental ones which is also equally important for our survival because of this we also have you know i'll skip this in the interest of the time people have realized that a, you know irrespective of you know a, you know what for example if every individual is different right so you know then how do you say someone is superior someone is an inferior that everybody should have you know certain kinds of you know equal rights in the world right each one is a different variant some may be visibly different variant some may be not so visibly different variant but everybody should have equal rights now as you can see here in the 21st particularly late 20th century in the early 21st century the more and more acceptance of human diversity and and more and more uh, you know uh, vocal support for equal human rights across the world this is something which is a conceptual you know um, uh, uh, contribution of science to our life i'll take couple of examples how it has actually helped in our material life right now whenever you know arnob gave an example of 100 years ago what einstein you know proposed help us to you know Uh, develop this mobile technology which we are using all of you know all of us are using now sometime it takes very slow pace sometime it can also be in real time so i'll like, give two examples slow time scale in the biological sciences this one when you know it took about 30 to 40 years after you know darwin and mendel to discover the the physical basis of genetic material what is called dna and and also what is the functional material which is associated with very different chemical processes called enzymes or proteins right for example insulin is one such protein which was discovered in 1920s and which was involved in glucose metabolism and as soon as it was discovered people realized that we can use you know insulin and also at the same time darwinian evolution actually helped us to understand that these physiological processes in glucose metabolism are more or less identical among all mammals so people started extracting insulin from slaughter houses and give that as a medicine for diabetic patients while there was a cure available now a treatment available now but it was very expensive because only a small amount of you know insulin was extracted from the slaughter houses but later with better understanding the chemistry of dna and very different technology that helped us to you know make the common dna technology what they call so you can now take insulin dna from human and put it in bacteria for bacteria is simply another piece of the same chemistry chemical molecule that it already has so it undergoes dna replication dna to rna transcription and rna to protein translation but what comes out is a protein called insulin which is useful for glucose metabolism in human cells so human system so you can take that insulin and give it to patients now it, the cost is so low now uh, the entire world the you know uh, insulin treatment to diabetic patients wherever insulin treatment is required is you know very affordable to the whole world this is another you know, example this happened over 100 years of time it's a slow process from darwin mendel to you know uh, giving insulin uh, which is made in bacterial cells but to look at what we had just experienced the last few years the basic science was was used every day uh, and also whatever we learned in the past was used to address this pandemic right within days within hours of whatever the new discovery happened on which virus how it enters our cells how it can be you know stopped and where the different variants are being generated which may become more uh, 
aggressive, which may become less aggressive, which may spread more, which may spread less, how to test, how to isolate. You know, all kinds of things were exchanged in real time because of the technology that we had. And that helped us to, you know, prevent uh, this pandemic uh, within, you know, about two years of time because of the vaccine that were developed and very different drugs. And finally, you know, it has come to a stage where WHO itself has declared that this pandemic is over. And just one or two more examples. Uh, I have another four or five minutes. Uh, will I sort of quickly take you through, you know, because I'm coming from India. India is one of the largest, uh, you know, uh, it is currently the, the most populous uh, you know, country in the world, 1.5, 1.6 billion people, right? And when India uh, became independent from British colonial rule in 1947, is one of the poorest of the poor countries. It had just come out of famines and, you know, the whole world had come out of Second World War. So there was so much of hunger and poverty uh, in India. And that's the time when, you know, Indian, uh, and those leaders, the leaders of that time decided that you, let's use the science, the way uh, to provide the solutions to the, the real life problems. And indeed, we invested heavily, even in the poorer state of uh, country, we invested heavily in science, basic science and technology both. Perhaps, you know, India is the only country which invested in basic science so much in, in such a state of uh, poverty. And that basically helped to become self-sufficient in food and nutrition. Now, actually, India is one exporting food and donating food to other countries. And the kind of mathematics and physics that we practiced, it helped to do the kind of space research that we're doing, satellite technology that we have accomplished, and of course, the IT revolution that came out of India and also spread to the whole world. Chemistry and chemical engineering was also well supported in India and which helped India becoming the largest uh, in the pharma industry in the world. It's actually the, you know, the supplier of the low cost medicine to the entire world. Same thing with vaccine and biotechnological production too. So India is now the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world. It all happened in just about 75 years and starting with a very small number of scientists and bureaucrats because they're the only literate people in those days. Even literacy was very low. And, in, you know, people always think that, you know, basic science should be nurtured and protected and, you know, sh you know, it should be protected and nurtured. And people think that, you know, basic science is only a luxury and you should, it can only develop countries can happen. But basic science is universal and you should be nurtured in every corner of the world because the talent can come out from any place. Even under extremely constrained conditions, people work. Right. It has been shown in the Europe also during Second World War, some of the major discoveries were made by basic scientists. Even in India, people have shown that under constraint conditions can do. For example, Raman spectroscopy, which every industry uses, every lab uses these days, all over the world, it has every hospital we use, was based on the work that Raman did under extremely constrained condition in Kolkata and in India. You know, before independence in 1920s, using that you know an, uh, uh, an equipment which he built, uh, you know, from a donation that he got from you know uh, some people. Other people in the recent time, in the last 30, 40 years, Shambhuna De, Dilip Mahalanobis, Ramalinga Swami, these are the people who did work which has actually saved millions and millions of life across the world. The rehydration therapy, or as what they call, or you know, which treating the diarrhea. The entire Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, Asian countries, everywhere it has saved millions. In fact, Ramalinga Swami's work on iodized salt is basically taken to the whole world, whether it's developed or underdeveloped countries. Plant tissue culture, the whole world knows about it. It's actually all the seed was, you know, uh, uh, the work was seeded in India in, in 1950s and which has now become a trillion dollar in the industry across the world. It all started with the basic science and understanding the process of de-differentiation in plants. Plants are the one, unlike animals, they can actually, a cell which is differentiated, can go back to its original state called de-differentiation and re can give rise to the whole plant. So going last word, India now worth is a, 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 you know, a global village and uh, we are all connected, uh, you know, a click of a button in real time. And interestingly, when in human evolution happened, and uh, we are a small group of people who are in Kenya or Eastern Africa and then migrated to multiple places and got isolated. That's why we have so many, you know, distant, uh, distinct sort of communities in Africa or Australia and Aborigines or, 
Papua New Guinea people, you know, separated by 30, 70, 80,000 years of uh, time. But now all isolated communities are connected because of technology, right? But the problems are also becoming global. Climate change is a global problem, right? We need, pandemic is a global problem. We need, you know, global science to solve those problems, but the solution is somewhat more local. So each country, each region has to look for its own innovative solutions for the local uh, the problems of you know, climate change or a pandemic because the impact will be different in different parts of the world. So science has to spread to the whole world. So as you can hear, you should have more basic science every part of the world, more interdisciplinarity because more and more scientists have to come together coming from different you know, disciplinary backgrounds. And there should be more internationalization of science and in scientific information. It should be peer reviewed scientific information should be available, you know, uh, you know, and uh, data should be available to everyone. Otherwise, people will rely on unsubstantiated information and irrational uh, solutions to their problems. So it's very important that we share, you know, valid information across the world. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.